With me now is Olympic rower and Dr. Jevy Stone. Jevy, it's an absolute honor to meet you. How are you today? Good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you so much again. So I read on the U.S. Rowing website that you love ice cream. Do you have a favorite flavor? Mint chip is definitely my go-to. And like the first flavor, we're on a training trip now. So the first flavor I bought to stock in the freezer is mint chip. Although at home, I have like six flavors on a regular basis. <laughs> See, I'm super weird because I only like chocolate ice cream. I don't really like anything in it. Like sometimes I could do M&Ms, but then the problem is M&Ms get like really hard because they're, they're so cold and I feel like I chip a tooth. Uh, no, thank you. But I will tell you the other day I had uh, Nutella ice cream for the first time. Oh my God, Jevy, it is the best thing I've ever had in my life. I highly recommend it. I'm going to look into that. But yeah, I go, no M&Ms, no gummy worms, no gum. They're just not meant to be an ice cream. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like pineapple on pizza. It just doesn't belong. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you started rowing in high school. I'm genuinely very curious. Is that a rather late start up for the sport or is that kind of typical? That's actually very typical. Uh, I knew more about the sport than most people because my parents both rode. But high school is really the earliest people start. And in, I know the London Olympics, half the group started in college. Huh. Just because a lot of people don't have exposure, where it depends on where you grow up. Yeah. Do you feel like uh, it would be advantageous if, if some people were to start earlier? Or do you think high school around that time is a pretty good start? High school is pretty good. In Europe, they start earlier in these little mini singles. Um, and I think if you do start earlier, you'd have to, they'd have to change the equipment, basically. So equipment comes in a range of sizes and it doesn't go down to youth sizes at this point. Um, so you'd have to make shorter oars and smaller boats to fit smaller people, uh, which is definitely something they could do. But it's also a lot of people in the US learn sweep rowing, which is you're holding one oar with both hands and you're leaning out to one side, depending on like either port or starboard. And because it's so lopsided, you can do, it's not like the best thing for a growing body. So by the time you get to high school, you're a little bit more formed, um, which is another reason in Europe they learn in singles. So you're got one oar in each hand and it's much more symmetrical and more even on the body. I have never been rowing in my life. All I know is I suck at swimming. And here in St. Louis, we have Crevecore Lake. We obviously don't have any oceans or anything. We have Crevecore Lake, and that water is green. So I'm afraid if I were to try it in there, like I'd fall in out and know what I'd catch. But I, I, I could always refer to you because you're a doctor, right? There you go. I mean, I've fallen in the Charles a few times, and I don't have any extra toes yet. But <laughs> can't count it out. Yeah, that is something. So you did not make the 2008 Beijing Olympic team, but you turned your focus at that time to medical school. You ended up making the London 2012 Olympics. What brought you back? What relit that fire uh, for, for you striving for the 2012 Olympics? Yeah, I actually came home after not making Beijing and knew that I was going to medical school in a few months. It was June 2008. And I told my parents, you know, I'm done rowing at the elite level. Like I won some U23 medals. I've won an NCAA championship. Like had a good career. I can go out like happy with this. I'm going to be a doctor. Like life is good. I'm just not good enough to be an Olympian. And like, that's word for word what I told them. And they know me better than I know myself, as is the case with parents frequently. And they encouraged me to keep rowing recreationally during my first bit of med school because I do better as a student athlete. I am able to focus better when I've worked out. It's better with time management. I'm able to like balance my frustrations between the sports and the school. And yeah, I'm just a happier person when I'm exercising as I think many people are. So I started rowing very casually after school uh, with my dad frequently on weekends and entered a bunch of these small races we have in New England in the fall. And I really wasn't racing against anyone. Like there were five people entered and I came from a top D1 school. So have some experience in my belt and I was racing like people who just learned to row from like D3 colleges. And was killing them, which I should kill them, but it still kind of felt like a surprise to me and reinstilled in me that kind of love of like, oh, going fast and winning and desire to do well. So I entered the head of the Charles, which is a bigger regatta that fall and ended up beating a few of the women who had made the Beijing team. And I remember that paddle back to the boathouse and the regatta director, who's a member of the same boat club as I am, came out on the porch and yelled to me that I had won. And I just had this sense of joy because I knew that I hadn't, I wasn't ready to give it up. Like that had proven to me that I might have the talent 
to succeed. And I knew that I had the desire and the passion and all the mental characteristics to give it another go. Absolutely. Now, what was it like balancing med school and, and, and training and competing for, for the Olympics? Because myself, as we were talking before the interview, uh, I'm in grad school uh, right now, uh, pursuing a social work master's degree, and I have time for nothing else. I, I'm baffled that you were able to balance both of those. How did you do it? How do you do it? Well, I didn't watch any Netflix or do much social, <laughs> um, that's for sure. And my weekends were pretty much spent studying. But I think if you are clever about managing time, it can be done. And I, I mean, I'd been an athlete in college, so I was used to balancing the practice and the studying there. Um, and took that to another level in med school. It helped that I kind of alternated the two. So I did two years of med school and then did take a leave of absence leading up to London and did the same in Rio. And then again, more recently with residency, there have been a few times where they've overlapped enough that it has been stressful. So my second year of medical school, I took step one boards, which are probably the most important test you'll take in all of medical school. And a week later flew to Europe to race in the world cup. So I was training full time and studying full time and I didn't do super well on the boards and I did fine at the World Cup, but it does make me wonder what would have happened if I'd been able to kind of focus on one and do more prioritization. Um, and I think that's been the key. It's like knowing which is more important. So there have been times in med school where my workout is a 10 minute body circuit because I just don't have time for anything else. Mm -hmm. And I work out over the course of a week, like, 80 minutes, which is less than a standard workout compared to like the two workouts <laughs> like a day I do now. Um, so knowing which is the priority at that moment. It's so funny because you're literally being the boat or whatever you call it. And you're like studying with your book. I could totally envision it. That's hilarious. <laughs> it does, I think, help to like, it's in the back of your mind, maybe not rowing. Cause there's enough to think about when I'm in the boat technically and that, that but definitely when it comes to like stretching or getting to and from the boathouse like that commute time mm -hmm. uh reinforces in the back of your head you're kind of thinking oh what did i learn today in class and like let's kind of <laughs> yeah repeat this material so that i can remember it a little bit yeah well that is absolutely incredible so walk me through i always love uh asking olympians this question walk me through your first olympic experience at the 2012 olympics how do you kind of keep yourself grounded i mean because to me, as a spectator, it seems like such a spectacle. It seems so nerve-wracking. Yeah, it's overwhelming, but in a great way. I think the 2012 Olympics, like how special they were, started the moment we – so I flew with my dad, who's my coach. And the moment we stepped off the plane, there were these two volunteers. There were men in their 70s probably in these bright purple polo shirts, the volunteer shirts, and like bright red pants. They're very <laughs> um, easy to spot. And they like grabbed us from the line, like Jevy and Greg Stone were like, yeah, that's us. And because we were just on this standard plane to Heathrow and like sped walked us through the airport and there was like special security lines for the Olympians and like special place to get the credentials. And so it just, it started then and there, like we were not being treated like your average trip. Um, and energy in London was palpable. I think the whole country was thrilled to be hosting the Olympics. Um, I think there was an insane wait list to become a volunteer. Yeah. And as an athlete, you could totally sense that. I mean, when you dropped your bag off, they were so excited to see you every day and getting food in the cafeteria and all those things. Um, it helped a little bit in London. We stayed in a rowing village because the rowing course was a two to three hour drive from the main village. And so we were on a campus of one of the local colleges and it was just rowers around, which made it like a cross between the Olympics and a world championships. So it like mentally makes it a little bit easier to tolerate. Um, and we also don't walk in opening ceremonies as rowers because we race day one of the Olympics. So we're up the next morning at 6 a.m. And being on your feet for six hours <laughs> the night before is not the best preparation um, when you've been training pretty much your whole life for the races. And so that I think you don't get that sense of like awe. Um, you kind of get it at closing ceremonies. And so this weird whirlwind of, oh my gosh, I'm in the main stadium and oh my gosh, the fireworks and, and it's ending. <laughs> but uh, we do get to rowings over the first week. So the competition was insane. Um, processing is probably the thing that is kind of 
you feel like a superstar more than many parts of the Olympics because there are people there to tailor you perfectly to your opening closing ceremony outfits and you try everything on. They have like two giant duffel bags, one Nike, one Ralph Lauren, trying on all the clothes to make sure they fit. They want you to look just right and you get this free stuff and that free stuff and your official Olympic ring gets sized. So it's, it's pretty special. So the 2016 Olympics, obviously at that one you medaled, was it kind of easier uh, at the 2016 Olympics being that you had already kind of been through it before or was it kind of the same? It was much easier to focus on the racing. I think I had come along in my rowing and had done well in the international competition leading up to the Olympics and had higher expectations for myself to begin with. And London was all about the experience. Like, it's been a dream of mine since I remember the Olympics as someone who could barely talk to be an Olympian. And to be a part of that was incredible. But when I went back the second time, it was about performance and really execution and doing what I know I could do. Not to say that I didn't enjoy processing and all the rest. I just was able, having done it once, did help focus on the rowing. Where do you put the medal? You would be so surprised by how many Olympi- uh, Olympians I've talked to that have lost their medal. I'm like, are you nuts? How does that happen? How does that happen? I don't know. People say like, they misplace it or, or oftentimes it's more of like it gets damaged because they like tour around the country and give it to young kids and the young kid drops it, you know, and stuff like that. But so many have said that they've lost it. I'm like, I have my chest medal from middle school right here so I can see it every morning. I still have my youth soccer trophies, which everyone gets one at my parents' house. So no, I have not lost my medal. I did have to send it back. The silver medals from Rio um, had a soft coating on the outside and there was a program to send it back and they got, they refurbished them just because with like general normal handling, they were getting very worn, but now I have it and it looks pristine despite showing it around and sharing it with people and kids and schools. And it's actually in a sock. Um, part of our gear package for rowing going to Rio were these wool socks that say USA and the uh, the climate in Rio is not such that you ever need to wear wool socks so when I got it they didn't have you get a medal and nothing to protect it with so I put it in this wool sock and now it's become you know it's good protection for the medal so it's in the sock on my bookshelf at home I'll be honest I was not expecting you're the first Olympian to tell me that they have their medal in a sock I'm going to be saying that all the time now it's a USA sock, if that helps at all, you know. Not really. <laughs> so have there, been any, worn. <laughs> have there been any bizarre moments while competing? I was talking with uh, an, an, a uh, hammer throw competitor from, from the Rio Olympics, and she said as soon as she got to Rio, she, like, she was in the bus with, with other Olympians, and she looked out the window, and there was this dead body <laughs> in, in Rio out there. Have there been any bizarre experiences for you? Um, not that bad. That's pretty extreme. I think the village was definitely a bit thrown together at the end. Um, People have talked about, I mean, the grass was sawed down recently and they were all in like 18 by 18 inch squares. And then they had these giant wooden stakes in the middle of each 18 by 18 wood inch square. So the grass hadn't actually grown together and there were these like stakes every 18 inches to keep the grass in place. Um, But... The biggest surprise, I think, for me was the conditions. I think rowing is typically slash hopefully done in relatively flat water. And in Rio, the weather is really unpredictable with the wind. And the day of our heat, so our first race, it was totally flat when we launched. And about 20 minutes later, it was white capping, swells. Um, They held racing anyway. There's a picture of me going down the course and you can't see the boat. You just see like from here up because the waves are so big on either side. And they decided that coastal rowing would be a great event. (laughs) They're going to add it to the Olympics because the spectators thought it was very entertaining, but it's not what we trained for. So as exciting as it was, and it ended up being okay and the water was much better for the finals. It, it just, it was a surprise to say the least. I envision that that'd be very stressful. You've kind of touched on this, but being a doctor, has that kind of helped you with rowing and and vice versa? Uh, How has it helped? You know, I think people expect it to help. I mean, I definitely know more about anatomy and physiology, nutrition. Um, Although the nutrition you learn about in medical school is typically rare um, biochemical diseases where you 
I don't know, maple syrup, urine disease, things that are not going to affect your average athlete because you know you have them when you're born. Um, but I do think that the time management and the grit that is required just in terms of being a medical student applies to being a rower as well. Both demand 100% effort and 100% dedication in order to be successful. And I think those lessons are easily interchangeable as well as, I mean, teamwork. Um, And it's also helped me realize what I want to do in terms of coming back to rowing in that I remember being in the operating room and holding retractors and you have to be still and hold this for like hours on end and thinking, oh, if I can do this for three hours, like I'd much rather do an erg test. Like this is terrible. (laughs) And so knowing what it can be like on the other side makes, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. So uh, definitely made me stronger mentally in terms of coming back to rowing and knowing that A, I really wanted to do it and B, that in some ways I was tougher than I knew I could be. Love it. Love it. Absolutely. So what are your goals? We are in a new year here. What are your goals uh, for, for 2021? What does that look like for you? The rowing goals or the other random goals? Yes. <laughs> we went around the table. So I'm in Texas now on a training trip um, for the next seven weeks leading up to Olympic trials with a group of other rowers on my uh, team. And we went around saying resolutions and everyone was like, we need the resolutions that are not rowing related. But I do have rowing related. I mean, to make the Tokyo team is definitely high up on the list. Trials are the end of February for the single and then the mid- middle of April for the double. So to be representing the U.S. again and hopefully to make that podium again to prove that this training has paid off. Uh, and on a smaller note, you know, I aim to stretch for five minutes before bed every night <laughs> and to get my email inbox down to like under 20 unread messages and other, you know, random <laughs> assorted things. <laughs> So when you obviously make the Olympics and you get a gold medal, is that gold medal going in a sock too, or are you going to put it on your fridge? They're heavy. I mean, I don't actually know how heavy they're going to be in Japan, but my magnets are not strong enough for that. So another uh, little sock. So probably a sock. It's, <laughs> at least it's on the bookshelf. You know, I kind of there. Uh, that, that, I don't even know what to say to that. That's so weird. Maybe someday I'll find some good way to hang them, but you don't want, people say, why don't you put them in a picture, picture frame and that you can't share them with people that way. Like you want them accessible so that when you do talks with schools and clubs and all the rest, you can share the medal. I think as an athlete, I have the experience. Like I remember being on the podium and I don't need the physical medal to remind me of that. Like I can just close my eyes and remember how incredible that felt the best thing about the medal is that it's a, I'm able to share that experience with other people. Like but, when they hold the medal and have that tangible item, they get a little bit of that feeling. Well, if you ever get bored of looking at your sock and bring it around, I live in St. Louis, mail it to me. I will put it on my wall. I'll figure it out. I'll make it look wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if I'll trust the post office with that as much as I love mail, <laughs> but as, if we meet in person someday, absolutely. And you know, in return, in return for your generosity, I'll give you my first place chess trophy right here. Oh, it's beautiful. That's a that's a serious exchange. Yeah, it got my name wrong though on it. My name is Matthew Perlman. And it called me Nicholas. I'm like, well, you. I guess they were expecting Nicholas to win, but I surprised them, right, Jevy? That's not even close. No, I mean, I but do love is- Nicholas Sparks. I probably said to one of the people, I love Nicholas Sparks or something. My favorite part about the medals. I don't know if anyone's mentioned this. So the medals. One side's relatively standard for the Olympics. The other is determined by the country. And in Rio, on the bottom lip, they put the event. Oh. And so my medal says women single. And that's my favorite part because it's like my medal. Yeah, absolutely. So before we go, last question I have to ask. If you weren't an Olympic rower, what sport do you think, that you, what sport do you think you'd want to do in the Olympics? Could I magically have whatever hand-eye abilities that I – don't have yes uh then tennis probably oh that's a great one yeah i think it has like a lot of things i love about rowing in terms of strength endurance mental fortitude um i don't have the eye hand or hand eye coordination so it's just not gonna happen but also major perk that you can do it and make money and like actually 
have it as a career, which mm -hmm. is, would be pretty sweet. Yeah. I would do table tennis because it eliminates all the running aspect of it. You just can stand there, and I, I think I'd be pretty decent at that. They're so quick. It's unbelievable. Oh. Yeah. Oh, this video came on. And they're Facebook. bouncing on their feet. I don't know if you're like really lacking the running. Like they're, they're active, <laughs> like up true. and down, up and down. <laughs> it is absolutely absurd how talented they are. Like I saw, I was going through Facebook and this one dude fell, but then he stuck his paddle up and he couldn't even see above the table. I'm like, this guy must have magical powers. I don't know how he, maybe, maybe it's like a hearing thing. Like he trained himself to hear where the ball went and then therefore like, like where he was supposed to go. I have no idea. You probably hearing and also just the repetition, probably having some idea of that's impressive. It that is, is one of the really cool things with the Olympics is seeing sports played at the top of their level yeah. and sports that you've never seen seen in competition before. It's yeah. um, pretty spec. Yeah. It's a special thing to get to go to the other events. Yeah, it is the best of the best uh, of athletes and you are amongst them. Thank you so much for your time, mm -hmm. Jevy. It was a pleasure Absolutely. meeting you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave the floor to you. If there's anyone you'd like to thank and how can people find you on Instagram, on Twitter, all that good stuff. Um, I mean, there are too many people to thank to name them all, but it definitely takes a village to raise an Olympian. Um, it is not uh, one coach or one boyfriend or anything like that. It's the club, um, the training partners, the chiropractor, the nutritionist, the weightlifting coach. It's my parents. It goes on and on and on. Um, it's not one person. And I am on Instagram and Twitter as Jeb Jebs, G-E-V-G-E-V-S.